All right, tonight's presentation is from one of our own, our Anita Mazik will be presenting on her journey as of a, an adult living with a hearing loss and what her um, journey's been like, but also what she can bring to the table to help and um, expand on our learning in our program um, and how we can utilize her with our families that we already work with. So Anita, I'm going to turn over the controls to you so you can go ahead and um, introduce yourself and go ahead and move the uh, presentation along. Start. All right. Hello there. I'm here. Um, I've joined my conference call, uh, conference call with the, for the presentation. My name is Anita Mazik. Mazik. And you all know I'm, I'm here to share with you about my deaf experience and how I've developed my speech and um, my hearing loss. Um, when I was a child, I grew up and um, uh, let me click on the next button here. It's not working. Let me see if, it's, if, I, see if I can do the right arrow. I don't know how to go to the next slide. Mm -mm. Mm. Anita, this is Carrie. If it would help, I can keep, I can remain with the control. And when you're ready to um, move forward with the slide, just let me know and I'll forward it for you. Okay, let's go ahead and click because it's not working. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh -huh. Okay, so I grew up and I was born and raised by my deaf parents. They didn't use their voices, and uh, they would do they would sign. Understand that both of my parents used different types of languages um, than they did at home. Um, they used home sign language, and then they also mixed that with Spanish and. Um, American language at the same time, ASL. So I would see both of those. And first, my first language was really visual, ASL, and uh, from my deaf parents. And then my when I was born, I, I watched the way that they communicated with me, and I didn't have any uh, speech skills. I didn't use my speech often. I used visual as a way to communicate and understand communication and language. Now I understand, you know, I was born and I wasn't born deaf, but later on in life, I my hearing loss uh, deteriorated. I was about three and a half or so, um, so I was not born deaf. It was very interesting uh, when I was I was born hearing and I could hear sounds. Um, and my, I could hear my parents' voices, and I could hear um, ums and sounds that they that they had uh, pro processed, and while they were signing at the same time. And then, um, when my hearing loss started going down, I was uh, going into school, into private education. It was a regular classroom, and they were all hearing, all hearing children, and I didn't know the difference really. And you know, that I, or that I was experiencing a hearing loss. I used uh, a backup uh, hearing aid, and I still actually have that. And I use it at home sometimes, or business meetings, or um, when I'm not. But when I go home now, I take it off. Now, when I was in kindergarten, in first grade, all the hearing kids, you know, my communication really was was nothing. And I noticed I didn't have any speech, and I just would watch and and copy and learn from what the other kids were doing. First, you know, I would uh, follow them. I thought that I was supposed to follow what they were doing. Uh, they would sit, and I would sit and listen. And I heard words. The first word, one of the first words I heard was like pink or purple, one or two. It was interesting. Way back then, during that time, there was no, you know, there was no. Um, no one teaching me um, while I was 
starting school back at that time. I didn't know how to really pick up education. Um, with my parents being a visual language and learning from them, and then now into a classroom where there's children speaking, I didn't really know, you know, how to navigate it all. So I just kind of followed everyone. That was in first grade. And then, um, next, picture. next picture. So as I was growing up with my education, first grade, and then um, I was about seven, in seventh grade, I transferred over to um, a, a deaf program. It was my first, you know, experience having met all the kids that were deaf or losing their hearing. I was just in awe. I wasn't, I didn't feel alone. I wasn't the only one. With uh, so many years in, in education with everyone hearing, and now I was not the only one. Um, so I grew up, and then it was it was tough. It was a tough situation. I was approached very by a lot of children, and it was challenging. I was about seven in, in about seventh grade then, and then I went to high school, and there was a lot of uh, complications there with the education and learning. Um, now let me back up a little bit. Uh, when I was in kindergarten. Um, in first grade, I would watch and I would observe everyone and what they were doing. And really, at that time, I had my hearing aid on, and I didn't really have any speech or speech therapy um, to help me train my speaking or my listening. Um, so, you know, I would just follow follow sounds and stuff. I didn't really know how to train train myself. I, and I only had my parents who were teaching me in their speech. And so really reading wasn't something that I really knew how to do. So first grade, you know, I noticed um, I had a book. I had to take a book home with me and read the book. And my mom, she was, you know, she would she open it up with me and she'd, she'd look at the, some words and she'd spell it out. And I didn't know what that was, those words meant. They were, my mom would try to fingerspell the words to me. And it would be like Bill, B-I-L-L, -L, it's the boy's name. And she'd say, you know, she'd mouth Bill, and I'd just look at her like, okay, well. I also had an older sister, and she would, you know, she'd mouth Bill. And she was hearing, and she would voice it to me and read, and then she'd sign it. And so I would, you know, I would observe that, and I would I'd get that, and so I would try to listen to at the word and then I started to pick it up once I made the connection between it all and so learning became more and more interesting I started to pick it up faster and was more interested and then I transferred into um, a program where there was uh, people who had you know were deaf and I was having more and more uh, problems with that my my speech and my hearing and then there'd be signing and um, so when I would go home, I would use my ASL, and it was interesting how I would go go through different situations in my life. When I transferred back to, you know, the hearing high school, and I would sit down, and it was a mainstream class. So I was so excited. I so wanted to be in mainstream. And before that, was I was in second grade. Um, up, up, up until before that, I was not mainstreamed. Um, my hearing program at my elementary school was very small. Um, for my primary education, there was very small people um, there, about seven, age seven to ten. And I tried, I tried to learn. I tried to learn math and, and practice my hearing, and I had problems with my hearing and. You know, I wasn't very good at listening. I couldn't hear very well. It was hard for me. It was difficult for, for me to go through that situation. And so then when I transferred back to high school, or transferred into high school into a mainstream program, I was very happy. I was thrilled. I was, it was more, you know, I had experienced deaf culture before. And I, and then I, before that I wasn't allowed to sign. And so I would be confused and then I could I could sign and then I was now into a mainstream and 
trying to connect everything with listening and my speech and um, visually taking it all in. So now um, I had a teacher who was, uh, was deaf and she would use ASL in the classroom and I was amazed with that. And finally I was real happy with that and there was some teachers, you know, that were hearing and they were very skilled at using their ASL, and that was pretty amazing to me as, as well. I didn't want to lose my hearing, though. I was my, my listening skills. So it was interesting. Um, I, when I was in the uh, independent program, um, I would practice my speech. And then when I transferred back to, you know, the, the deaf program, it was more signing. I got concerned. I didn't want to lose my listening skills. So it was very complicated. But now I'm, you know, I'm excited. I'm going into a hearing classroom, which was again mainstreamed, and there are some new challenges there. I had some friends that were hearing, and that was interesting. And then I graduated, and I went to college, and that was a really tough challenge for me. I was approached, and I didn't feel satisfied with my ASL interpreters. Um, I didn't feel satisfied with the classroom or the education that I was getting. I was um, I was distracted by uh, the interpreters and then the teaching at the same time. It, so it was it was somewhat of a challenge for me. I preferred to be in the deaf classroom where I could everyone was deaf and teachers were deaf and it was all the same. And I when I grew up I was I had deaf parents. And then and so I ended up, I had to learn to socialize with my neighbors and relatives. And then, you know, I had some support and I uh, decided, well, which college do I want to go to? Do I prefer Gallaudet where they're all deaf and it's all um, all the same? Or I thought, you know, it was, it was, it was nice. It would be a good social situation. I wouldn't be isolated. I have deaf family. Um, and I have some family who have, you know, Spanish um, sign language as well, and they can communicate. So I'm really not alone with with uh, with them. So Gallaudet, it was interesting. It would be an interesting perspective, and I thought Gallaudet would be wonderful. And my daughter, she is experiencing hearing loss, and she went and graduated from Gallaudet. Um, she had different motivations than myself, different perspective. So when I went to to pick, I um, took child development program and computer programming, and so I transferred over to Oaken Community College with an AA degree in language arts, or I'm sorry, liberal arts, and I was in a music class, and there was piano in there, and there was voicing in the classroom, believe it or not. Um, and it's don't it's not it, hopefully they didn't laugh at me. Um, so I took m music theory for two years, and I really enjoyed it quite a bit. And I got involved with that and music performance. And um, people would call my name. Um, they would give me the my name sign was like the sign of music. With the with a letter of an A, so instead of a, a flat V hand, it's an A hand, signing music. That was my name sign there. And then I transferred to the Illinois State University, and I got a degree in Human and Family Resources. And that's where I am so far. So you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Now I want I want you to understand how my communication uh, when I was growing up in my childhood um, in the beginning I had again my deaf parents with me and they would use sign language only at home we would we would sign to each other and my sister she was born um, deaf but she used uh, her voice growing up and. I, uh, for me, I could identify, you know, words like mom or dad, but full sentences, not so much. So I used a lot of gesturing with my body, and my fam family did the same. And my brother and my cousins and my uncle, 
They use their voice with words, um, and they also use Spanish at the same time. So very often, information would go over my head. Uh, my aunt and my uncle used Spanish and then English sometimes too. So it was it was interesting. I when I went to school, uh, private school, and I didn't have there wasn't any uh, signing there, and that school was very strict. I had to use only my voice for that, and a little bit of gesturing. And then I improved my speech skills from there, about the age of nine, and I started being able to use sentences. And then slowly, I my hearing skills improved, and as I grew up, um, again, I used a hearing aid, and I didn't pay attention to how to listen to words. So things would go over my head. And I full sentences I, I didn't comprehend. I really had to practice my listening skills. I started about seven to about nine. I started picking up more and more and more with uh, my listening skills. And, they, and then I developed my speech about the age of 13. And so I started to develop some self-confidence. At that time, you know, I was deaf, was I hard of hearing? I didn't know really which way I was. And then I had some ske some speech and some hearing, and so again, my, I was starting to develop self-confidence, and I had some support, and um, I, had, I had all these things. I didn't know who I was. I had, you know, deaf parents. I had Spanish-speaking family members, and I really wasn't sure. And then high school, I had made some friends, and I thought I was starting to figure out who I was. And, you know, my friends, they started to sign. And then I went to mainstream school in the classroom. And, there, you know, I had some hearing friends, and they could understand me. And I felt, you know, oh, I was so excited for that. And I could, uh, you know, talk with a hearing teacher, and they, they knew some of them knew sign and, and uh, speech as well. So that influenced me, and I really appreciated that. And them for that experience. Next slide. Okay. And then, you know, while I was going to to college, there was a mixture of um, social, there was uh, social situations. There was a mixture of deaf and hearing in the mainstream. And so I took up, uh, I went to the, the community college and they were all hearing classrooms, and I joined that. And so I, I would socialize some with the deaf at the college, and then some, some people would use ASL and voice, too. Um, I would use my voice with hearing people, and um, it would really it would depend on who I was with. You know, I would see some deaf at a place, and I'd see some hearing at a place, and I'd want, uh, you know, to uh, see some ASL, and I'd also use my voice at the same time. And so I would I would flip flop between communication styles, between ASL and voicing, and mixing them together. What I realized what happened with that is, you know, hearing people. They want to learn. They want to learn the language. So I, it's important for me to turn off my voice so that they can visually, you know, increase their their receptive skills. They could see me, and I and they can learn from uh, what I was what I was uh, citing. At the same time, I wanted to listen to their voice and improve my listening skills. So I made friends with them, and people who you know I had met that. Um, that could speak would help me improve my, my voicing skills, and we would go back and forth that way. And it was fun. It was fun to share and give and take back and forth and learn each other's languages, so to speak. And it was quite a benefit, you know, speaking and signing and English and ASL and children. You know, children, they must have English language and be able to read that visually. It's very important when you become older that you're comfortable with that, with your English skills and your English structure. You know, that's just my perspective and my opinion on that. 
for children anyway. And then some people who have hearing loss, you know, their speech is uh it's important for them to have some some ASL to back up what they what they are seeing. Um my mother had four children or I have four children, all four um are have experienced hearing loss. Um one profoundly deaf, and then the three other are hard of hearing, and they will they're losing more of their hearing as they become older. One of my children um is special uh has special language um needs um, very low visually, so um we have to use tactile communication and it's given me a lot of this has given me a lot of experience in how to communicate. Okay, the next slide. At home, um, my concern for people who live in the house, you know, like my parents who were deaf, that, you know, sometimes they don't have, you know, they might have a dog, um, we have like and we have like different different devices like if there's a fire if there's a smoke a smoke alarm you know weather warnings um my deaf parents used the dog they trained the dog to bark and kind of run back and forth and run back and forth if someone was at the door he would bark and and run back and forth I mean there was like danger or warning or something that's what my parents used when I was growing up at my time, but now it's improved with technology. There's, you know, much better devices that are in use in the home, like there's fire alarms with a light that will flash. Um, there's smoke alarms, you know, before the fire starts that, you know, have a light or something like that. There's, like, medical alert, um, you know, that have, like, flashing lights, like the carbon monoxide detectors that have, you know, a light that will flash. There's more visual for deaf people. And it's much more safe. Um, other important modernizations, um, like become, you can become more independent, like myself. You know, I get up, I get ready for work, I have an alarm that vibrates on my, under my mattress that I use. And if I, you know, if I travel or if I'm at home, at home I have a light with a light, you know, that light that flashes. But, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like I'm out, uh, the flashing light doesn't always work. So I use a thing that, like, vibrates and shakes my bed. But it's, you know, for independent, you know, individuals that have a little one, some of them the flashing light is okay. I love um, my video phone. Um, video phone um, most um, is what most deaf people use. Um, if a hearing, you know, parent has a children with, like, a hearing loss, they get a video phone. It's really nice. And it's you know it's a registered number and you know my video phone. Um, I have a deaf people can sign and I can chat with hearing people through a relay operator, and that's what I have now. She's speaking for me now, for that example. Um, video phones um, and powerpoints and and 5H. You know the deaf have different things that you know they can contact hearing people. It's really nice now. And it includes, you know, relay service. Also, for example, um, deaf people who have good voicing skills um, that, you know, maybe can talk to you or somebody else and they can he maybe hear my voice speaking too, they can still, you know, use an interpreter, you know, to make sure they're understanding what the hearing person saying because I don't hear all, of all well. So I will use an interpreter and call through that. And then, you know, when I'm finished, you know, they... When I speak, they can hear me speaking and they can understand me, but I don't understand them, so that person is fine, whatever they say. So it's nice, um, like with an adult or a child, you know, because you don't necessarily want them to lose those speaking skills. So it just kind of depends on the situation. Um, it's also important to have um, a flashlight um, in your purse. Um, suppose the doorbell isn't working, it's not flashing. So I can, you know, if they're not going to hear it, they're not going to hear it. So, okay, now what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So um, I get my flashlight out. I go up to the window, and I flash the light in the window. And they're inside kind of going, oh, I guess you better answer the door. So it's it's always nice to have the flashlight in your purse. And I always bring a flashlight with me. It's just a little small one. It's just a little LED light, that it, but it works. And, I, you know, when I'm driving, 
you know, I just I pay attention um, when I'm in my house. You know, if there's an emergency or something, I just see it with my eyes. But um, really, modern technology for hearing people and deaf people has just, I love it. It's gotten so much better. The OVO and hearing and deaf people, you don't need, you know, a relay all the time. You can just set up to download and you can just sit and, you know, I can sign hi and we can just chat back and forth on our phone. You know, if someone's learning ASL, you know, we can just communicate. It's fun. And um, touch phones, you know, we have, you can contact me. You know, I don't have to, you know, we can just, you know, do FaceTime. We can pick a time to talk. It's really cool. I love FaceTime and everything else. It's really, there's so much more. Texting, oh, we can text all the time. Ooh, it's really nice. I'm happy with that. Before, um, there was nothing. I mean, you just couldn't contact each other, you know. if you, you had to wait until they showed up and just, you know, try and figure it all out and, you know, do the body language or write notes back and forth. But now it's just the technology's gotten so much better. There's so many more ways to communicate for everyone. It's really cool. The iPhone, the iPad, laptop, all of that. Um, next slide, please. And now social skills um, are set, up, you know, setting up. There's such a variety of that. Um, in my life, I've, you know, had so much opportunity to socialize. Deaf people are out anywhere now. And also with, you know, they socialize with hearing people. You know, it's not, you know, some of them are, you know, they know sign language. Not always interpreters, but, you know, other, you know, professionals know sign language too. So. It's just important to have, you know, that ASL, you know, interpreters there so that, you know, they can make sure the communication is smooth and clear. It's really wonderful. We don't want a communication breakdown or anything. We don't want any barriers for the social gatherings. It's really nice. Um, some places don't provide interpreters. For example, bowling alley, they don't have an interpreter, but you don't really need one. You know, movie theaters don't. Sometimes they might have closed captioning. Not, obviously not an interpreter. Um, shopping malls don't usually have interpreters, for example. Stores don't have it. So, you know, how we can communicate, we either write notes or, you know, if say I can't find something and, you know, deaf people or their children, you know, they'll find someone else to communicate. You just figure it out. There's a variety of different ways. And like the parks department and, you know, amusement parks, they don't always provide interpreters unless you request one ahead of time. You know, you give them, you know, say the number of people or something, if there's a group or a special day or something for, you know, people with disabilities, and you can request interpreters. Sometimes they'll have them on that specific day. Like, for example, uh, like American Six Flags, they have a deaf day, and they have interpreters all over the park. I really enjoy it. It's really fun to just go around, and it's kind of like being normal and just going around the park. It's really nice to have, you know, to be able to socialize and prepare and, you know, request interpreters. And, you know, everyday life, um, you know, I have interpreters, you know, or people just approach you at, you know, last minute and say, you know, do you have a, and I just say, do you have paper? And I just write it down because I'm just, you know, used to that. Um, I don't always talk, you know, sometimes if I have a sore throat or something, or, you know, if I have a toothache or something like that, then I'll just write notes and just deal with it that way. There's all kinds of choices. Um, so... And you can use, you know, iPhone. You can uh, wait. Let me go back a little bit. Um, um, can you go back to the previous one? Okay, thank you. Um, like the iPhone, I can type and just show it to somebody. You know, you know, at the drive-through or something. I can, you know, just show them what I want. That you know, there are no problems if I'm talking to them. The problem is I can't hear them sometimes if they respond in the drive-thru. So it's better just to, you know, get out and just show them what I want. It just kind of solves the problem that way. Or like in a restaurant, you know, you can point to what you want. Because um, sometimes, you know, when I talk, I can't always hear, you know, if there's a lot of background noise or something like that. So then I'll just show them on my phone and it just solves the problem. Next slide, please. Um, now... You know, hearing in public transportation, for example, the Metra or Amtrak, um, if you have to go far, um, I always type online and let them know, you know, for special accommodations, you know, and the time and the day, you know, when I'm going to be arriving, and just kind of let them know, you know, I can't hear, so if there's some, something happens or a delay or you know, make sure to, you know, let the the ticket person that's coming by, let them know, I can't hear. Can you tell me if, 
anything changes, if, you know, I don't want to miss my stop when I need to get off, that kind of stuff. Um, if I'm on, like, an airplane that, you know, I let them know I can't hear. So if you make any announcements, you know, you need to write it down and give it to me and just let me know. And with the new t new technology today and the devices and the vibrations and online and the numbers and everything, you can just write, you know, the text number down and, they'll, and tell them, you know, the train's going to arrive late and they can just send it to a text so I don't have to listen to the announcements because obviously I can't hear it. So technology's really improved with that. Um, now I was like when I was back in high school and I had to, you know, use the transportation back and forth on the bus or something. Often I couldn't hear the announcements or anything and I didn't understand what they were saying and or it'd be all staticky and there was a lot of noise and I couldn't hear it. So I, you know, I may go up to, you know, the captain the captain on the train and say, you know, I can't hear, can you tell me and you know, I just kind of follow a certain group or something, but you know, now, you know, cuz it wasn't always so safe, so cuz maybe I'd be going to the wrong place, but so the best thing now was trying to, you know, read the map and, you know, count how many stops, one, two, three, four, and then I'd have to try and memorize that and kind of watch for it. But it's it's better now. Um, the safe way for me is I would just, you know, get off if I didn't understand what they said and just, you know, check it out. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the funny thing, when, when I'm talking in the dark, um, I love that part. Um, it's fun. Um, you know, like at the movie theater or, you know, like if you're sitting and watching a movie, um, the deaf people behavior, you know, is really, you know, it's nice, I'm sure. You know, it has to be the right etiquette. And, you know, when you're watching the movie, it has to be quiet and it's dark, so you're watching the movie. And when, you know, the lights, you know, come back on in the theater or the movie, and, you know, there's like the screen is up there and you can see all the light then you know when it's sort of like a real bright part of the movie then we try to have like a real brief conversation you know say oh that's cool or you know that's awesome or that's scary or you know just one or two words when it's really bright in the theater and then you remember what they said and then you save it and then after the movie's finished then we have all our conversations and remember this when it was scary and remember when it was the awesome part and remember this part and you have to kind of memorize it all in your head so that's kind of fun too and also when you use um, your hands, you kind of sign while you're like kind of do it like a tactile interpreting with your hands on it because it's dark. So that's kind of a fun little challenge too. And sometimes we use, you know, ASL or English language, both on the hands so that we can kind of understand it. Um, it's like communication with like a deaf blind person. It's, it's kind of cool trying to do that in a movie theater. Um, but the best effect when I'm approached with children when, you know, they approach me and they, you know, look at me and that, you know, it's their per first, you know, time they've seen, you know, a deaf person. And, you know, I might be their first or second. They've never really seen it before. And they're thinking, oh, that person has a disability. You know, that, you know, that person, you know, they, they know the feeling. It kind of is like an insult. But it's important how, you know, you look friendly and, you know, just come up and say, you know, hi. And, you know, will you, you know, chat with me? I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn your communication. And, you know, if the people, you know, not just look at them like, oh, they have that disability. They're different. You know, it's a different experience. Don't do it that way. Just, you know, recognize, yeah, it's different, but it's okay. You know, we just come up and, you know, make that approach and, you know, use your expression and, you know, just just like a normal chat. You know, so that we, you know, can feel the same and not like, you know, one of us has a disability or something. It's an important, you know, I'm trying to be honest and be polite and, you know, if you don't understand, that's fine. Just say, you know, I'm sorry. Could, you know, you explain that again. Do you mind maybe writing it down or, you know, something like that. That's enough. That's fine. And, you know, you don't want to offend someone, you know. You don't want to be fake and just sit there and say, yep, 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 and act like you understand it when you don't. It's okay to, you know, be honest and say you didn't understand something. But in n number one, never, you know, turn your face from that person. You know, keep the eye contact. Don't turn away to someone else and have, like, this little private conversation. That's kind of an insult to a deaf person. If you just, like, look away and kind of hide, it's, it's kind of a, an offensive action to, you know, turn away and hide your mouth and have this secret conversation with someone right in front of a deaf person. It's pretty offensive. So just wanted to make that clear. Next slide, please.
um, when you're talking with a deaf person on the phone through a relay service, um, it's very important, um, you know, to you know, say your senses. You know, the hearing person who's calling through the relay to the deaf person, or you know, a person with a hearing loss or anything like that. Never say, tell her, or tell him, tell him, tell her. Yeah, don't say that. Just say hi. You know, this is it's me. You know, just talk like you're talking directly to them. You know, so you're talking through the relay operator. Never, you know, explain, you know, your own personal, you know, conflicts or anything like that to the operator. The operator's just not really involved. They're just interpreting. Um, so, you know, don't use the tell him and tell him and, and, and have these whole little private conversations with the interpreter. They're just kind of that middle person. So it's important to just talk directly to the person you're calling through the relay interpreter. And the the relay person's not really involved themselves as their own person. Like suppose I'm calling through an operator to and I'm you know, I'm calling and I'm not gonna, you know, turn away and start having this other conversation with someone else in the room while the operator's still sitting there interpreting, you know, waiting for the deaf person at the other end of the phone. You know, if you know, don't just kind of have this other side private conversation. You know, that's important too, to stay focused on the relay call. Um, suppose if a hearing caller doesn't understand what the operator and the relay and the translation and the interpreter, you know, that they're calling a deaf person or what they're saying. Simple, just, you know, please could you repeat that again? Um, you know, could what what did they say? Or if the deaf caller you know, recognizes that, you know, the interpreter maybe made a mistake with a word or something, you know, maybe sign it again in their ASL and say, you know, make sure they understand, you know, I said that kind of prevents, you know, misunderstanding or misinterpretation. So that's important, you know, make sure that you understand because you don't want to offend the person and, and offend the deaf person and, you know, make sure it's clear and make sure the ASL is clear and, and you know, hope that kind of, you know, helps that understand that clarification. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, then kind of continuing with my life and understanding, you know, being hearing and deaf and communication and my education and growing up and, um, you know, just my success. It's been, I mean, I'm, I'm a good mother. I've had some good experience. I've raised my four children. With you know, when they have their own hearing losses, but they're all individuals too, and each one of them has had their own individuality, their own challenges, and their own special ways. So I accept them for who they are, and you know, it just it makes me you know just so proud of them with you know their experience with them, and I really respect each one of them individually. You know, the one that's profound deaf, she's really strong with ASL. The other two children are hard of hearing. One's you know prefers to sign, and the other one speaks. And then one of them is hard of hearing, and you know she her hearing loss is you know getting worse, but each one of them all four of them have their own individual you know they're each individual children and I've learned a lot from the four of them too it's i've they're they're my success stories um they're they're part of my education my successful education too is from them I've learned so much from them, and you know i've I've learned that by getting my degree and my education and interpreters and how to work with them in college and my friends and just you know so far I look back and you know I did it I can I can do it you know I've had I've had some other people involved and but my favorite quote that someone told me as a deaf person um, was sometimes I use hearing aids and you know it's nice to take a break and it's nice to you know have a break when you're hearing the world and sometimes it's just I take it off and just it's silent and it's a quiet, it's a nice world. I do take a break from the hearing. It's kind of funny to do that. But sometimes I do that later. So um, your information, you know, you can click and you can, you know, look at that and provide all the different, you know, the home, you know, all the smoke detectors, the carbon dioxide detectors and, you know, the time, the watches you know, they vibrate for like an alarm, you know, it's time for my medication or, you know, it's time I have to go to a meeting, it'll, it'll vibrate on your wrist. So it's kind of a reminder for that. Um, other ones, the doorbells, you know, they have different ways. 
they have different wiring, so the doorbell could, you know, send a, you know, signal with a wire. There's different, just a little variety. So there's a lot of things to, you know, look into. It's, you know, important to see what, you know, works for you. You might want what's cheaper or not. And thank you for your time and listening to my presentation. And next slide, please. Okay, so are there any questions for Anita before we move on to the post-test? All right, Jacqueline, if you wouldn't mind asking the questions again, that'd be great. You guys know what to do with the chat box. Uh, let me just make my chat box a little bit bigger there. Okay. And if you would go ahead with question number one, please. Question number one. Was Anita born deaf? A is yes. B is no. Okay, question two. Question number two. What are her communication modes? C. Lucy has left the conference. C is ASL only. E is vocal speaking and using ASL. And F is alternative using ASL and vocal speaking, or sometimes both. Has arrived. Guys, hold on with your questions of answers in three. You, you really throw me off and you jump ahead, okay? Okay. All right. Jacqueline, question three, please. Question number three. Does she have any of her hearing devices? F is yes. G is no.
All right, I will move it forward to question. Question number four. What college did Anita graduate with a bachelor's degree? A, Heartland Community College in Normal, Illinois. B, Oakton Community College in Des Plaines, Illinois. C, Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois. Or D, Gallaudet University, Washington, D.C. Question five. Question number five. How many of her four children have a hearing loss? E is two. F is one. G is four. H is three. I think I'm just missing Lucy. All right, great. All right, thank you, Jacqueline, for reading those questions. Thank you to Anita for presenting tonight and sharing more about yourself and your journey and some suggestions for families. And um, I appreciate your time. And thank you all for being on the call. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks.